Okay, welcome to lecture two of compliant mechanism design. Uh, today, um, well, this lecture I need to clarify is um, one of the few math lectures. So, lecture two and lecture three are almost entirely math. Um, and don't let it scare you away, they're by far the hardest part of the course. Um, uh, you know, you know, if you don't believe me, skip ahead to lecture four through the rest of the course. It's a lot of fun um, and, uh, you know, visualization and no more math. This is all the math that goes on under the hood. So, you know, don't jump ship on the course and think you can't handle it. Um, these are admittedly pretty tricky lectures. Um, I recommend you watch lecture two and three multiple times and just uh, take your time to digest them. Um, you know, the homeworks and practice problems should help you through them. But, um, yeah, if you understand these, uh, then, then the rest of the course should be a, a piece of cake. And it's, it's all fun downhill after lecture three. So, okay, so um, yeah, basically, you know, please don't drop the course. <laughs> Stick with it and, uh, you know, you'll love it. And, and even if you don't fully understand these courses, you should still be able to perform pretty well for the rest of the course. Um, uh, so, okay. But anyway, do your best here. So, um, again, you know, the, the topic of this is screw theory kinematics. That's uh, the main math behind my compliant mechanism design approach that I'm going to teach you later on. Um, and I just want to give you the math up front so you can have the whole quarter to digest it um, as you learn the, uh, you know, the qualitative uh, principles. Um, okay. Okay, so here we are. So let's uh, do some basics that aren't so basic, actually. Uh, we're going to talk about translational and rotational velocity vectors. Um, these are deceptively simple. Um, you know, they, they seem uh, very easy. You probably think you already have them mastered, but they're actually pretty tricky. So, um, so I'll, I'll try and confuse you here to convince you you don't understand the fundamentals like you probably think you do. Okay? So... Okay, so just a, a review here though. Uh, translational or linear velocity vectors are uh, three by one vectors, okay? And they describe the velocity of um, a certain body in three dimensions. So say you have coordinates x, y, and z, and please know in math um, that, uh, you know, the coordinate system has to follow the right hand rule. You go through, through x and then to y, and then z points along your thumb's direction. Okay, that's you have to know that in math. Okay, um, I've had some students that you know PhD and postdocs that didn't know that. So uh, definitely make sure you get your coordinate system drawn right. Okay. Okay, so you know, so so if you want a velocity vector here, there's three components that are defined relative with respect to the coordinate system. There's an x component, a y component, a z component of uh, velocity here. Now. You'll see this is a T here. That uh, stands for transpose. Um, this is actually, even though it looks like it's written as a one by three vector, this is actually a three by one vector because it's transposed. Uh, it actually moves things down like this. I just wanted to write everything in nice uh, horizontal lines. Um, but it's important that you think of these as three by one vectors, okay? Okay, so, so uh, there are th you know, three components um, and they have, uh, just like all vectors, they have magnitude and direction. Of course, the direction is specified by these three components the, according to the direction uh, here, and it's, it's the direction the arrow is pointing. And then, of course, it has its magnitude, which is the length of the arrow vector here, and it can be found by squaring each of the components, adding them together, and then square rooting them. Okay? And you can see the convention here. You put the absolute value sign around that. That's the magnitude of that vector v. Okay. So um, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and by the way, that magnitude is speed, right? So speed, the magnitude of that vector is, is, is the speed of the velocity. Velocity is a vector. Okay, so one thing to note is translational velocity ve vectors have a magnitude and direction only. They have no location. Okay, so l let, me, let me give you just kind of an example here. Um, and by the way, the thing that's going to confuse you is the fact they have no location, okay? Um, Okay, so um, say you want say this block was moving with a with a you know pure translation along the y-axis here. Okay, um, and so th there's zero x and zero z components here, and its its speed is v y. That's magnitude. Okay, is v y. 
And that's, of course, a speed or velocity. You know, the magnitude scalar value is the derivative of displacement with respect to time. So that's uh, delta D over delta T, and that's in units of meters per second, of course. Okay. Now, um, remember, so this vector only has magnitude and direction. Even though I've drawn it located there in the middle of the block, it doesn't need to be there. I could have moved it anywhere I wanted. Okay. Um, no matter where I move that vector, as long as it still has the same length and it's pointing the same direction, um, it, it, it conveys the same mathematical information. Um, it's the same thing as if I stand here and point you know, that direction, then I move over and I say in that direction, I'm still pointing the same direction even though my body moved over. So th these vectors have no location vector, okay? Um, just magnitude and direction. All right, so off it goes here in that velocity. Okay, so um, consider this body here, and say we have you know this arbitrary body, and say we care about these two points with their own little coordinate systems, and th this is the global coordinate system, um, your x, y, and z is coming out at you. Okay, say it's um, rotating. This whole body is rotating around this axis. Okay, well then the velocity the linear translational velocity of that point is going to be perpendicular to this, if you draw a line from the axis to that point, um, it'll be perpendicular to that, okay? And same thing with this one, it'll be perpendicular to that. So you'll see, um, and, and oh, by the way, this, since it's closer to the axis of rotation, we'll be moving with a slower speed than this one, so that's a longer arrow, that's a shorter arrow, okay? And you can see they're both pointing in different directions, okay? so. The linear translational velocity of all points on this body are uh, different. Okay, they point in different directions and they're different magnitudes. Okay, but they're obviously associated with a location. So this is where it gets confusing because you think, well, my goodness, you know, you know, it's obviously this velocity vector obviously corresponds to that location, and every other location in the body as it rotates around here for that instant um, will have a different. Uh, vector and so so we need to somehow associate that velocity that linear velocity with that location but if you just use a three by one velocity vector the traditional one like I showed in the last thing um, it can capture the magnitude direction but it can't capture anything about that location okay so if I just gave you the velocity vector at that point um, you wouldn't know anything about the other points you wouldn't know it's rotating around this axis you don't have enough mathematical information uh, to to, to know what's actually going on with the other, other points. And in fact, for all you know, um, it's just purely translated in this direction. All the points on it are moving that same velocity vector. Okay, so, so um, anyway, take away, I'm, I'm trying to confuse you here. Takeaway is, uh, you know, when bodies are rotating, they definitely, uh, the, every point has a different velocity vector, and that velocity vector is associated with that point, but there's nothing in the math that, um, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, conveys that. It's just, the, the vector just, just captures information of the magnitude and direction, okay? Okay, so let's look at uh, angular velocity vectors now, or rotational velocity vectors, okay? So, uh, in a similar fashion, they just have a magnitude and a direction as well. And say, here's the global coordinate system, um, x is now coming out at you, y, z. Okay, and they have three components defined according to the global coordinate system, and those three components are, um, uh, you know, defined with respect to this, and they tell you what direction it is. Okay, and um, and of course they have a magnitude, which is the square root of all these components added together, square rooted. That tells you the length of that vector, and. Um, yeah, again, they only have a magnitude and a direction. They don't have a location associated with them. Now, this is extra confusing for rotations uh, because um, in your mind, anytime something rotates, it's rotating around a certain axis. And that axis has a location. But again, this, this three by one, this is a three by one vector, remember this is the transpose there, uh, only contains information about the magnitude, the angular speed, um, and the direction, um, okay, not the, ac the location of the axis about which it's rotating, okay? So let me show you this example here. S say we had, say the axis was coming out at you, or the angular velocity vector, 
was coming out at you, okay? Um, then its direction would be omega x to the speed of it, the magnitude, the length of it, 0, 0, because there's no component in the y and z direction. And again, it would be, its, its speed would be omega x, and it would be the derivative of that theta, it's, you know, the, the theta that it's rotating um, with respect to time, and it would be in units of radians per second. Okay, so now if you take a look at it, you can see if I, if I show you that animation, then you inherently know that the axis of rotation is also right there, right? I showed you the axis of rotation. And I happen to align that um, angular velocity vector along that axis, which is, is deceptive. I didn't need to, okay? I could have moved it anywhere and it wouldn't have changed anything about this vector. It would still have that magnitude, that length, and it would still be pointing in that direction, okay? And um, it would still, no matter what, uh, rotate the same uh, amount in the same amount of time, okay? Um, and so, so just to confuse you more, so, you know, you look at this, and you know the axis is, corresponds with that vector, but now, and it's, it's, so say it moved, you know, 30 degrees in, in some amount, you know, some amount of seconds. But now, what if I move it like this? Say I have that motion path. And say it did that motion path. I'll show you again. Did that motion path in the same amount of time. Well, I could ask you, well, how much has it rotated? Well, it's still the same. It's still 30 degrees. So you can, if you rotate it back, it rotated the exact same amount, 30 degrees, and it did so in the exact same amount of time. So even though it wasn't clear what axis it was rotating around to get there, and honestly, it was a moving axis of rotation, uh, from instant to instant, that axis of rotation was moving, and it traversed this strange path, right? Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it experienced the same rotation uh, per second, right? Um, and so it had the same angular velocity, um, or average angular velocity in this case, okay? Okay, so this should already be confusing you, because it's, it's really tough to have students disentangle from their mind um, rotations uh, you know, that have axes, but angular velocity vectors say nothing about where that axis is um, and really have nothing to do with that axis. They're just the direction that they do correspond, the direction they point in corresponds with the direction of the axis of rotation. It just has nothing to do with the location of that axis. It's just speed and direction. Okay? So let me, let me try and confuse you even more here. Okay? So say you have a block here and it's got its coordinate system. Say you rotate it around there with an angular um, average velocity of 30 degrees per second, okay? Um, well, starts there and say, you know, um, one second later it's now moved to 30 degrees here, okay? Well, okay, so that block has rotated a total of 30 degrees in one second, okay? All right, well, let's, let's now, so it's a average angular velocity would be 30 degrees per second, right? Well, now, and, it, and it's rotating in the direction out of the page, you know, right hand rule is going out of the page with this magnitude, okay? Well, now let's pick a completely different location of the axis to rotate it around. Say, just, our, you know, we, we picked there before, now let's pick there, and let's rotate this guy now by the same in the same direction, going this way, right, counterclockwise, uh, with a magnitude of 30 degrees per second. Okay, well, this is now 30 degrees, and that's 30 degrees. So you'll see, even though they ended up in totally different places, going in totally different directions from a linear translational velocity standpoint, you know, this one had a linear velocity going that way, and this one had a linear velocity going that way, they had the same, um, they ended up in the same orientation, you know, they, they, they all rotated 30 degrees and in the same amount of time. So they had the same angular velocity, uh, average angular velocity vector. They were pointing out at the page in this direction and they had that magnitude, 30 degrees per second, okay? So the whole point of this was to show you that, yes, indeed, angular velocity vectors are completely independent. They don't care at all about the axis of rotation. They do point in the same direction as it, but they, they do not contain any information about the location, okay? All right, so now let's look at uh, another, you know, this, this uh, rigid blob again, and say we care about these two points on it. And again, say we're rotating around this axis. So now I'm giving you the axis, and I'm giving you the direction, okay?
All right. Um, well, let's just say it rotated 40 degrees, or you know, it, some theta, right? Well, that means this line rotated theta, and that means this, this guy, since it's stuck, the coordinates is stuck on this, this rotated theta, and then this line also rotated theta, and this is stuck theta, okay? So, so hopefully you can see from this that every point, the angular velocity vector at every point um, is the same. Okay, so, so if you now make this uh, theta infinitesimally small um, and just, just took the derivative of it at that point, so it's d theta, so this actually moved all the way back and it's basically on top of it, d theta dt is the instantaneous um, angular velocity vector um, of, of that point, right? And it's uh, 0, 0, d theta dt coming out at you, okay? So again, this, this contains direction and that contains magnitude, that's angular velocity at, th at that instant, okay? Um, so it corresponds to this guy right here, the angular velocity of that, but of course, it's also the angular velocity vector of that because it also rotated the same theta. And it's also the same angular velocity vector of every point, okay? So, so um, no matter what, if you're rotating around some axis, some amount, Okay, every point on that body is going to experience the same rotation in the same amount of time, and therefore will have the same angular velocity vector. And that vector doesn't matter where this rotation was. Okay, if I had moved this to a different point and did the same, you know, speed of angular rotation, every point would still have the exact same angular velocity. Okay, it has, it's just direction and magnitude does not know anything about the location, but I told you that location, okay? Now, of course, you need to know where that location is if you're gonna calculate the velocity, the linear velocity of these points, okay? Remember, I told you this is perpendicular to this line that goes to there, the instantaneous velocity, linear velocity at that point before, you know, before it ever actually rotates, it's a, a speed, okay? And what that would be, it would be d theta dt, which is the, you know, the magnitude of this vector, Okay, and it would be, you know, crossed by a vector that goes from there to there, and that vector cross a vector that goes from there to there will tell you the speed, and that ends up just being, if this length is d1, that ends up being d1 d theta dt in magnitude, and it's perpendicular to this, okay? And then uh, the velocity that, or the speed of that, or the velocity points in that direction and is perpendicular, to that, but its speed in like manner is dt2, which is that length, times d theta dt, okay? So again, these velocities are different. And, and if I just told you this body is rotating with this angular velocity vector, you'd have no idea what these velocities are by themselves because you don't know where this is actually rotating. If this were rotating at a different point, you'd have the same vector here, but you'd have different d1s and d2s, and so these velocities would be pointing in different directions and be different uh, magnitudes. Okay, so you can see there's some weird relationship between linear translational velocity and um, angular uh, rotational velocity. Okay, but for now, really all you need to understand is they're both just three by one vectors. Uh, they both only contain information about direction and magnitude and not location about where they're applied or where they're, what axis they're rotating about, except the direction of the axis, not the location of the axis, okay? Okay, so let's do some exercises to try and confuse you even more. By the way, pretty much 90% of this lecture is just about rotations and translations and how to package uh, motion mathematically. So once you, you know, it's, it's really helpful to finish this whole lecture and then go back and watch it a few times uh, with fresh eyes from what you just learned to really understand them. Okay, because they're, they're, like I said, deceptively simple. Okay, but they're, they're actually quite complex. Okay, so let's look at an exercise here to try and confuse you. Note the coordinate system X is coming out at you, Y and Z. Here's, um, here's a square here. And it takes this square, watch it go around there very carefully here. It takes it five seconds to, tra to traverse a circular path with a diameter of, D, of, of 10 meters. Okay, so I'll show you that again. Watch it go around, it's just a constant speed all the way around, okay? And the question is, what is the square's rotational velocity vector 
omega at the bottom most point of the circle. So when it reaches down here, what's its angular velocity vector? And then the next thing is, what's the square's translational velocity vector when it's at the same point? So what's the v at that point? Well, um, if you watched carefully, you would see that when it went around, it never actually rotated. It, 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 sure, it lo it's going in a circle, but it never changed its orientation. It was always uh, remained in that orientation, and so it never rotated. And so at no point along the circle did it ever have any angular velocity, and so um, its angular velocity is 0, 0, 0. Uh, make sure you put a t because it should be a 3 by 1 vector, okay? And you don't need units because they're 0, okay? In this, in this course, it's very important you put units if it's something that's non-zero. Okay, so it never rotated, and so of course that's the angular velocity vector at this bottom point. And then what's the linear translational velocity vector? Well, it was going at constant speed. It did, uh, you know, the, the distance of this circumference here, the perimeter is um, 10 pi, right? Um, and uh, I mean, it took 5 seconds to get all the way around, so 10 pi divided by 5 is 2 pi, and it went in... Uh, you know, and so when it's down here, it's going in this direction, okay, v, so that would be 0, negative 2 pi meters per second, 0, and make sure you put the units there, okay? Okay, so that, that's one uh, little exercise. Let's go to another one that tries to confuse you uh, more here. Okay, now I want you to watch this. Again, it's going to take the square five seconds to go around, except this time, look what it's doing with its orientation. Okay, so it takes the square five seconds to do that. It's the same diameter circle. And I'm going to ask the same questions. What's the angular velocity at this point, and what's the, the velocity at that point? Okay, well, um, right, so, so how many radians did it, did it rotate? Well, it, it rotated two pi radians uh, over the whole course, and it did it in five seconds. And it did it in the negative x direction, so you do negative 2 pi over 5 radians per second, and then 0, 0, okay, is, it w would be, right, w would really be the um, angular velocity at all points along here, okay, because it, it did a, a constant velocity o overall, you know, um, uh, and so, you know, it maintained the same velocity at every point, so that was its angular velocity at all points, including this one we asked for, and then, um, uh, when the you know the, when the square is down at the bottom here, it's 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 going to be the same speed because it, it traversed the same 10 meters per you know uh, 10 meters times pi, which is the circumference, so 10 pi meters, <laughs> and you did it in five seconds, and it's it's going in the negative direction, so that's negative two pi meters per second. So it's the same linear translational velocity at the bottom, okay? And notice um, this would be different. It, it would it, it's, uh, Linear translational velocity vectors always point tangent to the path. So if I had asked you here, the vector would be pointing down there. If I asked you here, it would be pointing there. I asked you here, so it's going that way, right? So it's always tangent to the path, uh, linear translational uh, velocity vectors, okay? Um, whereas the angular velocity vector, uh, in this case, points into the page and it doesn't change through the whole thing, okay? Okay. Okay, so let's, um, let's see here. Yeah, let's, let's try and confuse you here a little bit more. So, um, so with that little exercise in mind, and, and you know, you're beginning to understand um, this notion of velocity, uh, both angular and translational, um, here's, here's some of the confusing takeaways, okay, that we need to tie up here. So if I only provided the omega, the angular velocity vector, of one point, okay, so say I gave you the angular velocity vector of that point, then you'd know the omega of all the points because they're all the same, okay? If something rotates, say I didn't give you this, but if something rotates with some angular velocity vector and you know, therefore you know, you know its direction and you know its magnitude, then you now know the angular velocity of every point, okay, since they all rotate the same amount at the same time. But you wouldn't know the location of the rotational axis, right? Um, and, and if I just gave you that vector, yeah, I mean, you could think of it rotating around any, any point. And uh, it's, a, it's totally different motion, of course, if it's a different location. But it's the same angular velocity vector, OK? So you wouldn't know this. If I provide the v of one point, 
Okay, so say the linear or translational velocity vector, say of that point, say I give you this, you would not know the V of the other points unless you know that the body was purely translating. So if you knew the whole body was translating at that speed and in that direction, then you would know uh, the velocity of every point. They'd be all the same. They'd be the same vector in the same direction, and the location of that vector wouldn't matter at all. It was just in the direction it's going with that magnitude, okay? So only when you know it's purely translating, it's not rotating around any axis, then you just need your three by one vector and every point's the same, okay? But if I didn't tell you that it was purely translating, but I just said, I just gave you the linear translational vector of that point, okay? Well, then you don't know anything other than the magnitude and direction of that point. And there's nothing in the math of that vector that would tell you it's at that point, okay? Because uh, the, the vector doesn't contain information about the location. So, um, so the bottom line is if you want to know the rotations and translations of every point of a body at any time, the minimum amount of information you need is you need to know the velocity vector of some point and the corresponding angular velocity vector at that same point, which would be the same angular velocity of all points, right? Because angular velocity is strange like that, right? Okay, so if I gave you this vector of that point and I gave you the angular velocity vector of the whole thing, then you would know you could deduce and back out that it's rotating around that axis, you'd know its location, and you'd, you'd know everything about it, okay? And it doesn't matter what point, you could pick any point, okay? So this is what um, screw theory recognizes, this is how screw theory packages uh, motions of a body, is it basically, um, it basically gives you the angular velocity and linear translational velocity of the global coordinate system um, of, of some kind of motion. So s say some body is, is rotating and moving in some weird way um, and you assume that the global coordinate point, this point here is on that body, say it's encompassed, you know, th this, this body right here encompasses that point um, right here, it always gives you the rotations and translations of that point and then you can know the rotations and translations of every other point in there and now you know ab about, and you can find where the axis is that it's rotating about or you can find if it's purely translating or if it's doing some kind of screw motion which we'll talk about in a second, okay? If you didn't understand that, don't worry about it. We're, we're about to talk about it now, okay? So that's the topic of the next um, uh, subject, okay? Okay, so there's something in screw theory called twist vectors, okay? Twist vectors is a six by one vector. Okay, first of all, it's T. Notice it's bold T. And it's a six by one vector where the top three components are the omega, the angular velocity vector, like I said, of the global coordinate system. And V is a, you know, a three by one vector. So this is a three by one. That's a three by one, making a total of six by one. The V is also the translational or linear velocity of this point and they're both defined with respect to this x, y, and z, x, y, and z, okay? So, um, yep, so you have a, a vx, vy, vz in this vector, it points somewhere, and then you have an omega x, omega y, omega z, that's that vector, and that contains six by one, tells you the, the three rotations, three translations of that point, okay? Which I happen to have drawn a body centered on that point, but it doesn't need to be, right? That body could be anywhere, and you're just thinking about, um, you know, there's some motion that's going on and no matter where that body is, and no matter where its points scatter about, you can know everything about their velocities, um, angular and linear, uh, just by knowing the angular and linear velocity of that point, if it's stuck and attached to that body, okay? Okay, so these twist vectors have an axis, a line of action, Okay, in this case for the rotation, this is a rotational twist vector. Okay, it's, it's, I, I, I define it as a red line. That's actually the axis about which everything's rotating. Okay, so again, I, I draw them red, they're rotation lines. And I draw sometimes these circular arrows around it to show that it's rotating around that axis. And you'd imagine the whole world, everything rotating around that. Okay, so this point, you think of the global coordinate system being stuck to the body that's rotating.
and it's actually moving, it's rotating around that, okay?